All right, I want to bring you a message tonight called Learn More, See More. <laughs> Learn more and see more. John chapter 4, verse number 22 is where we're going to begin. John chapter 4, verse number 22. Did I tell you I've missed you? I've heard some great things, though, about the, the services, and uh, my wife accused me uh, of telling Pastor Troy all the things she needed to be preached at about. Come on now. <laughs> she said, did you give him a list? Amen. I'm thankful for all of our pastors. They, they have done a great job and uh, uh, just have set the bar so high that uh, here we go. All right. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. More than anything, thank you, God, that you have saved us so that we might serve you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the grace of God, the love of God. And Lord, I ask you now, open this message to us. In your name, amen and amen. John chapter 4, verse number 22 begins like this. This is the Lord speaking. He says, you, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. Or even another version says, you don't know the one you worship. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed, it's here now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Can I get an amen for God's word tonight? Amen. And I want to dive into this, this passage, but as we're going into this, let me just ask you a question. Have you ever tried to watch a movie or a television show with someone who knows a great deal about the subject at the center of that scene? Someone who, who knows the technical side of what's happening, and, and as, they're, as they're watching the movie, they become frustrated with the inaccuracies of the make-believe world. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And they'll, they'll tell you about it. Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you, I, I, I don't mind a, a, a decent, clean medical drama. I don't mind one at all. In fact, I woke up this morning about five something. I had a horrible headache. I, I went to my office. I, I read the Bible. I prayed. I, I, read the, I literally prayed with my hands in my head like this because I felt like my brain was spinning in, inside of my, uh, my head. And, 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 and I, when I finally finished, I still wasn't uh, where I, I felt like I could function and, and I was just exhausted. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to drink a cup of coffee and I, I'm going to watch one of the shows that, that, that I recorded while I was gone, and so I, I put it on. It was uh, seven, seven, maybe eight o'clock this morning. I said, "Then I'll, if I'm better, I'll, I'll shoot to the office." And and, and so I, uh, and sure enough, afterwards I was. But it wasn't before I had a frustrating moment because Christina, knowing that was very odd for me because I don't do that, and she's come in and she said, "What's wrong? Why are you sitting here watching?" TV and I told her what was happening and so she just sits down with me for just a moment and we start watching this this medical drama there's a reason that that you're watching it and it's not really all the other things going on but uh, but it, it's hard to watch a show and she's like that would have killed the person if they gave them that amount of that and I'm like just watch the show we're trying to decide if, 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 if that's really his daughter or not. You know what I'm talking about. Come on in. And just watch the show. And, and, and all of a sudden, the guy, uh, the guy goes, you know, he, he goes blue and out. And the doctor rushes to his side and calls a, a code blue. And Christina, she's like, I can't take it anymore. His heartbeat is perfect. There's nothing wrong. There's no need for a code blue. I'm like, you're missing the point she's like no they're missing the truth you see the problem was this when you've learned something you will see it differently when you've learned something and you know the details of something you step into the scene and you analyze and you respond differently because of what you know I can I don't know where this illustration just came from, but, uh, but, but my mother is, is, is a gifted 
biscuit and gravy prepare, can I tell you? I'm telling you, where I have had friends fly through the Atlanta airport and call me and say, and say, say hey, Don, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, I know why you're calling me. Yeah, can you get your mom to cook biscuits and gravy for us? I'm like, you're going to drive an hour and a half for my mom? Yes. Now, I want to tell you, because of that experience level, I have been to other places, and immediately I see it. I can tell you what's wrong. I taste it. I can tell you what's wrong because I have tasted and seen that there is better in this world. But the point I'm trying to make is once you know something, you can't just miss it. You see it. You walk into the room. You see something. There's Maybe it's in your line of work. You would catch something. There may be someone has done something. I don't know how many times this has happened. And I'm like, isn't this amazing? They did a great job. And, and uh, let me just tell you, uh, I don't know why this, this illustration just came to mind either. But, but I remember one time we had a, a campaign around here. And for years, my, my, my passion uh, outside of ministry was uh, uh, graphic arts. And, and so I, I had really worked hard. And I had created a new campaign that we were moving into for a season here in our church. And we had made some really awesome graphics. And I mean, it looked really 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 good and 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 i went we had a new hire for our ministry at that point and and this person their specialty was graphic design and i'll never forget this moment because i I was so proud to welcome i wanted them to see that that we needed their talents but we also were they were coming into a place that understood their uh their level of skills and i laid that graphics plan out in front of them just showed them where we were headed and and they just put their hand right down on it just i mean just smushed right on it and and said this to me they said pastor this shows me that it's God's will that I'm coming to your church. I said, why? They said, you won't have to put up with anything as ugly as this anymore. I said, well, we'll see. They walked in a few weeks later with the plan the way it should be. And I have never done graphic design again. But they saw all the flaws because they knew. Are you, are you following where I'm going? They knew. Now let me, let's get somewhere spiritual with this. You see, there's a lot of things that when you learn, you can go deeper and benefit from. I'm reminded of a, uh, this morning as I was preparing this message, I was reminded of a moment. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to promote anyone's show, but, but I, there's a show uh, of, of two guys riding around in a van going into dirty barns picking stuff anybody know what i'm talking about that's probably my favorite show on television i i have a dream of climbing through dirty attics and dirty barns come on now but i was at an estate sale and at this estate sale i noticed something in a very insignificant box with a bunch of junk and and and, and this box sold for five dollars five dollars and so i had to have that five dollar box based on what i had learned from that show, I knew that I was getting more than a $5 box. And that $5 box turned into five baseball cards from 1910 worth a few thousand dollars. You see, I didn't just see an ugly box with some trinkets in it. Because of what I had learned, I could see on a deeper level. You see, we're surrounded with knowledge on every side. Did you know that there is more information in the Sunday edition of the New York Times than the average person living in the Middle Ages would have consumed in their entire lifetime? If we want to know something, we just pull out our phones and we find it out. As a matter of fact, arguments are not near as fun now as they used to be because it's quick to prove who's right and who's wrong. Misquote a movie thing, and everybody can show you in just a moment the clip from that movie. You see, I'm not convinced that we need to know any more nowadays. But I am convinced that we need to begin to do more with what we know. With the proper application of knowledge comes a greater opportunity to embrace the world around us. I know this, sound, this sounds a little new age, but, uh, but what I'm trying to say is that... that embracing sin or not embracing sin but rather when we know the truth we can see past the lies of the new age and avoid the sin because we have been uh, 
saturated with the truth. I want you to understand, if you learn more, you're going to see more. The more you know of botany, the more you will see uh, as you gaze upon a meadow. Or the more that you will will perceive the the depths of what's happening there. You see, what what the eye sees is determined by what the brain has learned. When an astronomer looks into the night sky, they have learned to see connections that most of us will never see, and they can, they can put constellations together for us because they have learned those things. They see more because they know more. When musicians listen to a symphony, they have a greater appreciation for the chords, for the melodies, and the instruments because they hear more because they know more. I don't know how many times we'll be sitting in a restaurant and, and, and Michael and Paul will be having lunch, we'll begin to discuss the song that's playing and, and, and I'll just shake my head because I didn't even know there was a song playing. But because of what they've learned, they hear more because they know more. You take a dish that maybe you love to a chef and the chef tastes that dish and and they will taste more because they know more and they can tell you what's in there and maybe what you could change and how you could tweak that because when they've learned, they can see things on a deeper level. Now, what does this have to do with our scripture tonight? Well, let me take it back to an older version. John 4 and 22 says this, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. You're trying to worship a God that you don't know. The Samaritans were worshiping a God out of ignorance. And I want you to get this. When we worship out of ignorance, our worship is empty. You learn more, you will see more. And when we're worshiping in this place to where we really don't know who we're trying to connect with, we've not spent any time getting to know the one we're singing about, we cannot see the depths of what's happening. That's why someone beside us might be singing the same song and they might be blessed to the uttermost. And we're missing out because we don't know the depths of what those words even mean. I mean, it's sort of like, have you ever been in an argument and you apologize, not really knowing what you're apologizing for? Come on, men, you'll understand what I'm talking about here for a moment. You don't really know what you're apologizing for. You're really just apologizing to end the argument. (laughs) Yeah. But how many of you, your wife calls you on it and she's like, what are you sorry for? You say, I don't know, I'm just sorry. (laughs) I was born that way. Come on. What are you wrong about? I don't know, but I obviously am wrong about something. You see, when you offer an apology that you don't know what it's for, it's hollow. When you offer worship that you don't know what it's for, it's hollow. I want you to understand that. It's like when we offer that apology, if we're just trying to satisfy the moment. But most of us worship in this hollow way. We sing words on a screen, but do we really know what they mean? If God interrupted our singing and said, uh, excuse me, excuse me, what is that line about? Could you explain that to me? If God showed up and he said, I I really like the tone of your voice tonight, but, but what are you trying to tell me? Here I am, you've sung and you got my attention. Would there be substance? Would we have to think about it? Would we have to process? Am I making sense to anybody tonight? You learn more, you see more. And so, in order to go to a new depth of of, of understanding who God is and moving into a deeper place in in worship, we have to understand what Jesus said solves this. Are you ready? John 4 and 24. God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in what? Truth. You see, your knowledge 
in your, is your worship ceiling. What you know about God determines the depth of the love that you can offer to God. Pastor Don, I, I, I'm not sure I get this. Let me tell you, this is not in my notes. And I'm stepping back for just a moment, but I want somebody to get this. Until you have experienced grace, you don't know how to worship God for grace. I'll never forget a young man uh, preached his first sermon here in the church. He was probably about 14 years of age. It was many years ago. He preached his first sermon. He came into this sanctuary with a, a, a sermon that was probably the equivalent to Jesus tying the cords and beating the people in the temple. He beat this congregation for about 20 minutes. With If you had faith and if you had this... Psh, 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 and I thought, my, my goodness, son, I know God's called you, but, but one day, one day you're going to grow up and you're going to preach that same message in a different way because you're going to preach it through the eyes of grace. People say to me, Pastor Don, please don't judge. And I say, no, you have to understand, I can't sit in judgment of you because the same grace that I give is the same grace I shall receive. And, and you can't understand the depth of that until you've needed a little bit of grace in your life. You can never worship God for who He really is until you begin to know who He is. You're going to have to come into the knowledge of who He is because great love is born of great knowledge. When you know Him deeper, have you ever been around somebody and you're like, I, you're like, whoa, they're awesome. They're awesome. Man, I, this is great. This, this is going to be a great friendship. I, this is going to be awesome. And, and then you get together with them the next time, you're like, well, they're okay. And about the third or fourth time, you're like, oh, my gosh, I don't ever want to see that person again. They make a good first impression, but, but, but they don't last. It's sort of like it tastes all right in the beginning, but it's bitter by the end. That's never that way with God. When you taste and see that the Lord is good. When you know that His mercy does endure forever. And when you understand that His mercies are new every morning. No matter how bad you've been, He's still good. And He's still faithful and He's still a mighty God. You will understand when you begin to worship and sing about the love of God that comes down and consumes us. And you sing about, am I making sense to anybody? When you begin to understand the depth of who He is, then when you worship, it goes to another level. Because as you know Him, it lifts your ceiling of worship to a, a new and an intimate place. Because the more you sing, the more you know, the more you'll see. Am I making sense to anybody tonight? Wow, y'all are in trouble. Somebody has unplugged the clock. But I have a what? But anyways, knowledge does not automatically translate into worship, but quality of worship is determined by the quality of knowledge. You see, the more you know, the more you have to worship. So learn more and worship more. When you begin to study yet even the very fabric of our universe, I, I don't know how many, Todd and I were talking about this earlier, but, but I had a worship moment over a viral video this week. And it's one of the silliest little viral videos that's probably going around right now. I mean, I'm out of the country and I, I don't even know what time it is. I mean, y'all are... are, are Y'all are blowing up my phone. It's 3 a.m. where I am, okay? So I'm awake, and I'm, I'm just surfing your pages, seeing if y'all are living right. Come on, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just flipping through my, 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 my homepage, and I'm flipping through. And all of a sudden, I said, well, I'll just watch this viral video. And it, it was about this caterpillar. How many of you have seen the caterpillar that looks like a snake? Just watched it. And I saw that for a moment. And at first, I was like, that's kind of, oh, that, that does look like that. How many of you have seen it? You know what I'm talking about? Anybody? Just a few? Okay. Y'all going to all be on going, where's that thing at? <laughs> but I, in a moment, I said, how great is our God who created this creature 
with the ability to camouflage himself from danger and protect himself by looking like this other uh, creature that ve- looks like a viper. By being able, this, this, this harmless little caterpillar changes who he is. And I, I, didn't, I didn't think, oh, what an amazing caterpillar. I thought, what an amazing designer. The more When I saw it, I began to, to elevate my worship of a God who creates, even down to the finest details of a caterpillar, what they need in their lives. And if God will create what a caterpillar needs, how much more? more will he create what we his children need so that we can serve him faithfully and he'll bring us through every trial and every fire and we can say God is good. Amen. You see, we've got to get to know him more. We've got to begin. And so how are you going to begin to know him more? You see, we don't, we don't have to wait to worship. God embraces us right where we are and he's not waiting for you to know him enough to worship. He wants you to worship where you are and as you begin to worship, he'll begin to reveal himself to you in new ways. To allow God free access into our lives will move us further along. Get this, your worship will grow as the word grows in your life. Now, I had about five good amens. It's every mature saint. Come on. If you want to learn, we used to have a worship leader that I picked on all the time. I said, I want to know where you go. Every one of them had their unique flavor. But this one, I said, I want to know where you go. And, and he said, what do you mean in the beginning? And then he understood later. But I, I said, you close your eyes and you get this look on your face that shows me you're somewhere that I want to be. All right? I want to get there. You see, you won't learn the intimacies of the depth of who God is unless you begin to get in the Word and allow Him to reveal Himself to you. Your worship's going to grow as you spend time in the Word. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 15 says it this way. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman. I want you to notice that. A what? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Okay? Workman shows somebody who show is somebody who shows up every day. A workman that 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 definition there. It's someone who shows up to a task every day. Study to show yourself approved. A workman, somebody who shows up faithfully every day to the Word of God. Pastor Don, I want to know God more. He gave you a picture of Himself. He gave you an illustration of himself so that you can see it through his word. It will reveal himself to you. And you need to find yourself in the role of a workman who wants to go deeper in worship because you showed up in the word. Pastor Don, I don't know how to read the word. Look, look. Do not pick up your Bibles unless God tells you and begin in the Old Testament. I have read it cover to cover since I was 12 years old. There are times still that there are books that feel like they're pulling teeth out of my head. So-and-so begat so-and-so, and and they begat so-and-so, and and they begat so-and-so, and and then so-and-so begat so-and-so, and and -and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And I'm like, I don't really care. (laughs) But other times God reveals to me the backstory, But I couldn't see it in the beginning. You get over to the book of John. You start reading the book of John and start letting this God who became flesh, who dwelt among us, become a reality. And I feel the Holy Spirit as I'm speaking to you. Become a reality in your life. And as you begin to see him for who he is, then you're going to begin to see him around you as he is. See, when when worship meets the word in our lives, we become overwhelmed by God's goodness. When we realize that that God doesn't have to do for us what he does. When we realize that others did not receive what we've received. That other generations didn't have the light of the word. That other generations didn't have this truth. God wants his word inside of you. The law required kings of Israel to, to make a copy of the law. They had to make a copy of the law in their own handwriting. They were required to keep this with them at all times. Literally, they had to write out. I thought, man, that's pretty powerful. That if we had to, what would happen if we had to write our own New Testament? Copy, copy, boom, boom, boom. Keep it with us all the time. The kings were required to write out the law, keep it with them, 
so that they might study it day and night. And the main reason, the main reason that they were required to do this, are you ready for this? was because, listen to me, was because as they read the Word, it reminded them that they were no different than anybody else, that they had to stand by the goodness of God. The Word reminds me. Can I tell you, I've grown in God. I have. I'm not who I was last year. After this trip, I don't think I'm who I was last week. I'm not who I was 10 years ago. I'm not who I was 20 years ago. I'm not who I was. But this week, I cried out to God because of the moral fiber of my being not being the reflection of Christ that I want it to be. Now, I'm told that every pastor doesn't say that. What I really just said was I I cried out to God because there's stuff in my life that needs to get out. You know what? I don't think I'll ever stop crying out to God. Because we're going to be constantly changing. And when I read the Word and I see the way Jesus said to do things, and I realize I don't want to do them that way, I want to do them another way. It brings me to my knees. And I say, God, help me to become who you want me to be. Now, I don't mean to be silly when I say this, but, but I have a really, 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 really strong desire sometimes to slap stupid people. I'm serious. Have you never had anybody walk into your life that just has that look on their face like, slap this off of me now? <laughs> Come on now. How many of God speaking to you right now? Come on. That's not Christ-like. I'm like, but Lord, you beat him in the temple. <laughs> you know. He's like, you're missing the point. So I prayed this week, God, forgive me for the judgment I want to enforce on their way of thinking. Change me. I'm not asking you to change them. I'm asking you to change me. And as you change me, I'm trusting you're going to do in them what you want to do in them. God. When somebody hurts somebody you love, you get angry. But it's better to get along with God than get inside of yourself and do something you'll regret. Am I making sense to anybody tonight? You'll know more when you see more. And when you learn more, you're going to see more. You see, the Word will remind you, when you get in the Word, it will remind you that we don't deserve the grace we have received. And it will remind you who you are and who you can become in Christ Jesus. You see, most of us are judging our standard by where we are. But we've got to start judging our standard by where he's calling us to. I'm glad that I'm not where I was. Can I get an amen for you like that, amen? But we're not where we need to be yet. Well, let me start bringing this to a close tonight. You see, both the word and worship remind us of our position in the universe. That we are not at the center, and we're not even close to the center of the universe. Without worship, we will live like the world revolves around us. That's the truth. If you feel like everything's revolving around you, your worship is out of place. As a matter of fact, you have an idol in your life, and it's called self. But word reminds me it's not all about me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there's not a third and then, you know, that that you should, you know, do this and this for yourself. You're going to love others the way you want to be loved. But it's because it's a reflection of who God is in your life. And when you start realizing, just imagine for just a moment that 100 years ago, 150 years ago, they... They thought there may have been a hundred million galaxies. A hundred million galaxies. Now we understand there are billions of galaxies that never cease. So we are not even the center galaxy. And our planet is not the center of our own system. And we're not at the center of our own world. And somewhere way over there, 
In the middle of nowhere is this little insignificant speck on this little insignificant speck of a planet in the middle of an insignificant universe that all of it doesn't revolve around. But yet, the God who it all revolves around Look past it all. He sees you. He loves you. He hears your worship. He hears your cry. And when you come to know him more, the depth of your worship is only going to flourish. You're going to find the reason to sing a song like I'm part of the family of God. You're going to find a reason to sing a song like I'm saved to the uttermost. Worship reminds us how small we are and how big God is. I know that there's an author behind this character, but I, I don't know of all my sermons if I've ever quoted Sherlock Holmes before. Sherlock Holmes said this, The chief proof of a man's real greatness lies in the perception of of his smallness when we begin to realize who God is and who really loves us a man is measured not by how much he knows but rather by how much he does with what he knows to know that God loves us to know that God cares for to know that the one that all does center around focuses on us. That is the seed that will grow into a life of a worshiper. You see, we should be driven to know more so we can worship God more. The more we discover, the more we find out about the intricacies of our bodies, the more we find out about the, the universe, the more we find out about the animal species of this planet, the more we find out about the beauty, beautiful things that God in heaven has created should cause us to step back and say the heavens are declaring the glory of God. That there's something inside of me that cannot help but celebrate what a good God has done. I'm trying to close. I'm sorry. I, I've got 15 minutes. I could preach longer. But can I tell you what just popped into my heart? My wife sitting there watching the medical drama, watching the, all that unfold as it all unfolds. Wow. She sees the little details. Can I tell you, I don't know who this is for and this was not in my sermon, but can I tell you that when you're looking over the scope of your life, if you've not learn the grace of God, the love of God, you're going to miss some things that are blaring at you. And other people are going to see them. And they're going to say, well, look, wasn't God good here? Wasn't God good here? And wasn't God faithful here? And look what God did here. And, and, and once you learn to see that God's been with you all along the way, you're going to rejoice and realize that when you thought you were forsaken, you were not forgotten. You were not even alone. He was there in his goodness and in his mercy. He's been good. He's been faithful. Would you stand with me? I hope that somehow you'll get that simple principle. You need to learn more about him if you want to see more of him. Bow your heads with me in this place. How many of you would say simply with me in this place, Lord, I want to know you more. Can I see your hand? Almost every hand in this place. Father, you see every hand. And I know you. And I know yet even what I see because of what you've made me be able to see. That you are reaching out to us now. And you're reaching out on a personal level so that people might know you more. Put your hands down for just a moment. I'm going to declare this over you with your heads bowed for just a moment. God sees you. You are not insignificant in His sight. You 
have been the center of a chaotic world. You have been the center of pain. You have been the center of problems. You have been at the center of struggle. Some of you are literally dealing, the world you're in, swirling and swirling with pain and problems and struggles. And the God of heaven is beckoning you to know him. Because when you know him, then you'll learn to see stable places in the middle of this chaotic environment. Right where you are right now, God's speaking. God's speaking to change people's lives that you might know God, that you might learn who he is, and you might see him in your life. If you're here tonight, nobody's looking around, everybody's praying. We felt God. God's word is spoken to us. Now it's your time to respond. If you say tonight, Pastor Don, I want to know God. I want to know God. That's the first step. To surrender your life to Jesus Christ. That you might know God. If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you any more than anybody else who raised their hand a minute ago. If that's you, you say tonight, I want to know God as my personal Lord and Savior. I want to know Jesus. Can I just see your hand? right where you are would you hold it up high thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you wow hands are going up all over this place god's changing lives thank you anybody else we're about to pray god's speaking to me as you come to know him you're going to find a reason to worship like never before all right, take a hand to the people around you if you would tonight. You don't have to cross over the aisles or anything, but just reach out if there's someone next to you. Take their hand. The Bible says this wonderful verse, that if we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that we would be born again. And this many tonight, some are rededicating and some are finding Christ for the very first time. As they pray to receive Christ tonight, they're going to be changed for all eternity. We're going to all pray with them now as we pray what we call the sinner's prayer, but as in faith, it's a step declaring that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord of our lives. Let's pray together. Jesus, by faith, I believe your promises. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I repent of my sins. I believe Jesus came for me he died for me, and now he lives for me. And by faith, I am now forgiven. I give you my past, my present, and my future. And now, in Jesus' name, God is my Father, heaven is my home, and Jesus is my Savior. Amen and amen. Now come on, give God a praise tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. God is so good to us. He is so faithful. Let me tell you what a blessing it is. I want you to know him more. Look for him all around and you will find him. Now, hey, look, I'm looking forward to being here this Sunday. I'm excited about what God's going to do. And I'm really excited about next Wednesday night. If you show up here at church, we will not be having service here next Wednesday night. Next Wednesday night, we're going to be at Warbington.